Alrighty, good morning everyone. It's great to be with y'all here this morning. Um, so in preparing for this lesson, I just want to go ahead and start off with a quick question. What does it mean to repent? Uh, that's, that's a question that I think we all, we all need to ask ourselves. Spoiler alert, I'm going to end off my lesson, uh, you know, giving everyone the chance to repent. That's what we usually do at the end of lessons, at the, at the end of, a, of, of our, our sermons and such. Um, but if, if you can, um, today that's what I want to focus on, the, the idea of what the Bible teaches us about repentance. Uh, I want to go through a couple examples uh, that the Bible shows us of, of how repentance works and how we can learn from it. Uh, uh, the word repent in the Meridian Webster Dictionary, uh, it, gives, it gave multiple definitions, but I think there's three that I want us to focus on today. Uh, the first definition, to repent means to turn from sin and to dedicate oneself to the amendment of one's life. The idea um, that you change who you are as a person, uh, you essentially turn around from the life that you once had. Uh, the second definition is to feel regret or contrition, aka remorse. The idea that when one repents, they have, um, there's an emotional change um, where they understand that the actions or the beliefs that they once held were wrong and it, it fills them with a level of, as it states, regret or remor uh, remorse. Um, and finally, the third definition uh, that Meridian Webster gives for the, uh, for the word repent is to change one's mind. The idea that a belief that you once had, something that, um, that you trusted in for years, uh, you end up changing due to uh, experiences or information that is brought to you uh, that, that, is, um, that you come to understand and, and believe. It causes you to repent. Um, there are multiple verses in the Bible that talk about the idea of repentance. Um, I'm just going to go through a couple of them here today. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Uh, this is Jesus at the beginning of his, of his, uh, of his ministry, of his service. Uh, he tells the people then, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus is professing the kingdom of God that is to come, that being us today, the, the, the church that is founded um, on the death of Jesus, that is the kingdom of God. We are part of that now. Um, and in order to be part of that, Jesus is telling the Israelites at the time, the Jewish people, that they needed to repent, that their hearts needed to change um, from where they were and to, and to believe the gospel that he was bringing and to follow him, um, that the old law, the law that they'd followed for thousands of years was going, to, was going to come to an end and that Jesus was going to complete it in his death. In Luke chapter 15, verse 7, um, Jesus, he is given a parable about the importance of repentance, of, of how much the Lord loves, uh, loves it when people repent, when, when people choose to turn to him. Uh, Luke 15, verse 7 says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Uh, the idea is how, how the Lord loves it when people have that change of heart, they have that change of mind, when they uh, when they come to the conclusion themselves that they need to follow the Lord, that they need to do what's right um, and listen to what he says, there is, there is a great joy that is brought to the Lord for that. And uh, the last verse I'm going to quickly bring up before we get into the meat, the meat of this lesson today is Joel chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, this is one of the minor prophets of the Lord. Um, he is uh, chastising uh, the nation of Israel. This is well before Jesus' time um, as they have uh, once again departed from following him, you know, have fallen to, uh, to false worship. Uh, Joel, uh, the Lord through Joel says, verse 13, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Here it's talking about how, how much the Lord, uh, the how important it is to the Lord that our hearts change. You know, he's, he doesn't want to punish us for him not, uh, when we decide to not follow him. That's not what he wants to do. He will do it if we choose not to follow him. He will bring that disaster, but he is, uh, but he is steadfast. He is patient with it. Um, in, the, in the meat of this lesson, we're going to see just how, how much long-suffering and how much patience the Lord has for those, um, for, for, uh, for humans. Um, you know, so much so he gives them time to repent, whether they choose not to do it. He always wants to offer that opportunity to anyone, and he wants people um, to have that change of heart, to, to truly follow him and, and to repent of their sins. So I just wanted to go over that beginning part today, um, and I want to focus on two characters um, as we're talking about. Give me one second. I really should have printed out my notes. Okay, that's fine. Um, there are two main characters that I want to talk about today. The first one is Ahab. Uh, if y'all had been with me earlier, 
last year, in November, December, I was giving uh, less, a series of lessons from 1 Kings chapter 16 verses, uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, 1 Kings chapter 16 through chapter 22, yeah, um, th- those few chapters we were going over uh, back in November and December, and we were following, uh, we were following what the Bible told us about the events that had occurred during Israel at that time. Um, the main character of that section of the Bible was King Ahab, and he is a character that is, a tr- is, is ultimately a tragedy, um, and I want to talk about him today, so we're going to give a brief overview of his story. So if y'all wish right now, um, if you wish to turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 16, um, and we're just going to be giving an overview through, uh, through those chapters. Uh, to give you a bit of context in terms of, his, uh, in terms of the, the history of the time, uh, uh, king Ahab was, uh, he succeeded King Omri as one of the kings of the northern kingdom of, of Israel. At this time, Israel was split into k- two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom of Israel uh, ultimately had no good kings. Um, all of them were evil in the eyes of the Lord, and they chose to follow in their, in their own desires. And Ahab was uh, just like his father. He was uh, he was evil, and the Bible actually describes him as being more, more evil than his father. I'm going to go ahead and read chapter uh, 16, verses 30 through 33, as it reads, And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ebthal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. So every other king before, before him, when the, when the northern and the southern kingdom split, uh, Omri, Jeroboam, uh, all of those that, that, had, uh, that were his ancestors, essentially, those that he followed after, they had already... They were already considered evil in the eyes of the Lord, and Ahab was, uh, we read here, was already considered worse than them. You know, he, he set a new low, essentially. And so, so we, we kind of get an idea of, of who this guy is. He's, he's clearly not a good guy, but like I said, he is ultimately a tragic character, and in reading through this section of the Bible, we learn to understand why he is a tragic character. One of the, uh, another major character of this section of the Bible from chapter 16 through 22 is Elijah. Elijah, we understand, um, was not just a prophet of the Lord, but he was understood to be the prophet of the Lord, someone who, uh, who continued to follow God in spite of the persecution that he faced, you know, in spite of the difficulties that he had. Um, you know, Elijah was viewed hundreds of years later by the Jewish people as a major prophet, you know, someone that they could look up to, someone that they could learn from. And, and even today, we can learn from Elijah too. Um, and I hope that during that study that we had a while back, you know, we were able to learn from Elijah um, and, and how we can grow to be followers of God. Um, but Elijah basically was a prophet of the Lord, was someone who followed the Lord. And him and, him and Ahab, if you want to look at it, were almost kind of like rivals. If, if, you, want, uh, if you read this section, uh, chapter 16 through 22, there's a level uh, Ahab pro- uh, most likely not, not only viewed uh, Elijah as his enemy, but also as his nemesis. Um, uh, just going over the chapters real quick, chapter 17, uh, Elijah brings a drought to the land of Israel, uh, punishing them for the fact that they had given to idolatry, that they had departed from the Lord, and ultimately the person to blame for this, uh, for, for this idolatry, for this lawlessness in the land, was Ahab. Ahab, as king of the king of the Jewish people of, of the northern kingdom, he could have made changes. He could have ter- uh, had them change their hearts to turn to the Lord, and yet all he did was just push them further into sin, push them further away from God. So as a result, Elijah punishes the people and punishes Ahab for that. In chapter 18, uh, many of us have heard this story in, in, in our Bible classes. There's the great showdown on Mount Carmel between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, who uh, King King Ahab had supported. He was on the, on the side of the false prophets, and we all know the story um, that they both offered sacrifices to their gods. Um, the prophets of Baal brought their, uh, brought their sacrifice to Baal, and nothing occurred because Baal did not exist, uh, to put it bluntly. Yet Elijah brought his sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord was able to display his might uh, uh, to the Israelites to show them that he was, in fact, the one true God, and that they had been serving a false god all these years. And at the end, at the end of this uh, confrontation on Mount Carmel, Elijah brought back the rains and was able to restore the land. 
in chapter 19, after this great event had occurred, Ahab had been there at the showdown. He had seen that, the, uh, that these prophets of Baal that he had been following for so long, um, they were false, and that, in fact, the one true God was real, the one that Elijah served. His, his enemy's uh, God was the one true God. And yet, in chapter 19, while he's not a major character, uh, his wife Jezebel ends up persecuting Elijah, ends up uh, trying, to, trying to kill Elijah for what he had done um, on Mount Carmel. And Ahab, as king, could have done every, uh, could have uh, prevented her from persecuting him. After all, he was the most powerful, la- most powerful man in the land. Uh, he could have told her, "No, Elijah is a true prophet. I'm going to protect him. I am king." You know, he could have done that. And yet, whether he was afraid of her um, or he genuinely agreed with her, you know, he did not choose to protect Elijah when he had the opportunity to. So as a result, Elijah had to escape once again into the wilderness in chapter 19. Um, and like I said, he was a mi- he's a minor character in that chapter. Uh, the chapter focuses more on Elijah, uh, but, but we already, we can under- there's a level of a- uh, understanding that we see from Ahab on how he messed up in that chapter. Chapter 20, uh, going into that one, Ahab goes to war with, uh, with Syria against, against Ben-Hadad. Uh, he, he wages war against the northern kingdom of Israel, and a new prophet comes into the picture, a new prophet of the Lord, not Elijah, but another one. And this prophet tells, uh, tells Ahab what to do, and he tells him, uh, you know, follow my instructions. The Lord has given me these instructions. If you do these, you will succeed in this battle against Ben-Hadad. And he does actually follow the instructions. For once in his life, Ahab decides to listen to the Lord, and he ends up succeeding in the battle. And ah- Ahab is given Ben-Hadad as a prisoner, and he is tasked with withholding Ben-Hadad prisoner until, until the Lord tells him what to do. But ultimately, Ahab makes the decision to free um, to free Ben Haddad, it was his own desire. Um, you know, he felt it would be beneficial to him to let Ben Haddad go, and as a result, he once again disobeys the Lord um, by letting his captive go free, and he is cursed by uh, by a different prophet of the Lord. Chapter twenty one is the is the ultimate culmination. The Lord. Um, the Lord had shown, had allowed Ahab to do all these evil things, but finally in chapter 21, uh, with, the, uh, with the events that occurred with Naboth and his death, the Lord had um, had, had it up to, up to here with, uh, with Ahab, with his, uh, with his evil. Ahab had wanted the vineyard of Naboth. Uh, he, was a, he was an innocent man, a just man who had lived nearby Ahab. He wanted his vineyard so that he could grow his own garden, but Naboth did not wish to sell the land, so so as a result, Ahab was, was upset about it, and he allowed his wife to conspire and manipulate uh, people into uh, murdering, uh, murdering Naboth, um, you know, accusing him of heresy, accusing him of evil, uh, when Naboth had done no such wrong thing. And, and what is it? And while Ahab did not orchestrate the murder of, of Naboth, you know, he didn't, uh, once again, he, he was king of the land. He could have done everything in his, in his power to prevent Jezebel from uh, from, from killing Naboth, from conspiring to murder Naboth. Um, and, and maybe he might not have stopped her, but he could have looked into it, found out why did Naboth die after, you know, I tried, I tried buying the land from him. He could, have, uh, he could have upheld justice. He could have um, punished those who, he could have punished Jezebel, and he could have punished those who had conspired with her to murder Naboth. But instead, as soon as he heard that Naboth was dead, he took advantage of the situation and bought the land uh, for himself. And that had angered the Lord greatly. We're going to get back to that in a little bit. And chapter 22 uh, concludes with the story, uh, with the, fi- the final account of Ahab and his death. Uh, multiple times he had disobeyed the Lord. Multiple times he had chosen to follow his own way. And at the end, uh, there is one last prophet, Micaiah, who tells him, uh, who tells him because Ahab wanted to go to war once again with Syria, with Ben-Hadad. He wanted to launch an offensive war, whereas the previous one was a more defensive one. Um, he wanted to, to, uh, to, to attack Ben-Hadad in advance, but uh, but Micaiah had told them not to do that. The Lord had professed that if Ahab went to fight against Ben-Hadad, he would surely not just fail at the battle, but end up dying. And Ahab chose not to listen to the, to the words of the prophet, and in turn, he ended up dying, and his story ends there. So just, uh, just going through those accounts, going through those chapters, uh, you know, it paints Ahab in a very negative picture, which it should um, because like I mentioned, Ahab was ultimately an evil man. He chose not to follow the Lord. But like I mentioned earlier, Ahab was a tragic character. Um, he is someone that we can learn a lot from because going back to those chapters, we see not only is there a level of, 
of understanding that Ahab had, you know, a level of like him starting to understand uh, what, the, uh, what God wanted for him, but we also see the Lord's long-suffering and the Lord's patience and mercy that he had for Ahab. Um, it had a point, and we saw, that, uh, we, had, we saw that limit in chapter 22, if you read through that. Um, but the Lord granted much long-suffering and much mercy to Ahab. In chapter 17, when the drought is brought onto the land, um, Ahab could have died in that drought. Yeah, he was king. Yeah, he probably had a lot of resources to protect himself, and no doubt the drought was difficult for him. But the Lord could have chosen to kill Ahab during that drought, and yet he didn't. He, he allowed Ahab to live. He, he blessed him in that way, um, you know, wanting him to hopefully repent, wanting him to, uh, to suffer and see that he needed to follow God, you know, to understand that, um, that Ahab and his people were suffering due to the sin that they were falling in. In chapter 18, um, during the events of the showdown on Mount Carmel, the prophets of Baal are all killed by Elijah, 400 of them. Elijah had the upper hand in that moment. He chose to kill the prophets of Baal because of the heresy that they practiced against the Lord. And, and Elijah at that moment could have chosen to kill Ahab too. You know, after all, uh, Elijah had the support of the people who were there at that moment. You know, he was able to, uh, to grab all of the prophets of Baal and strike them down. He could have struck down Ahab too, and yet he didn't. So we have to ask ourselves, why didn't Elijah kill Ahab at that moment? Why didn't the Lord uh, command him to do that? And honestly, um, if you read chapter 18, Elijah and Ahab actually have a bit of talking there. Um, and, from, and based on these context clues, it's safe to say that Ahab was starting to believe at this moment. You know, after all, he saw with his own eyes the evidence that, uh, that Baal was a false god and that Jehovah was the one true god. So there was probably a, a, a moment of repentance that he had, a moment of, of clarity that Ahab had, you know, realizing, wait a minute, Elijah actually has a point. You know, how is he able to do this? Surely the god that he is following must be the one true god. But ult- um, so... So, you know, so as a result, Ahab's life is spared because, you know, he was slowly starting to follow the steps of repentance. He was slowly starting to understand where he was wrong. But then in chapter 19, you know, he returns home. He returns back to Jezebel. He returns back to his palace. Um, and whatever belief he had, you know, that doubt that was growing in him, you know, to, to slowly maybe, maybe follow the Lord, maybe, uh, maybe obey him, uh, it went away. You know, he allowed Jezebel to persecute uh, Elijah, and he went back into his old ways. In chapter 20, we see once again Ahab is, is slowly starting to follow the Lord when a new prophet comes into the scene, and this new prophet is telling him, you know, follow the Lord's instructions and you will succeed in this war. And he does follow those instructions. But once again, we see in chapter 20, uh, Ahab fails, you know, instead of trusting the Lord and keeping Ben-Hadad as a prisoner, he chooses to release him and in turn, you know, follow his own judgment, follow his own desires instead of the Lord's. Uh, chapter 20, uh, 20 ends, you know, he is cursed by another prophet for his failure to follow the Lord. And it ends in a level of sorrow that Ahab has. It, uh, in my Bible, verse 42 of chapter 20, it states, And the king of Israel went to his house, vexed and sullen, and came to Samaria. There was a level of, of regret and remorse that he had over his actions, over him disobeying the Lord. Um, but it didn't lead him to a godly repentance. It just led him to being upset that, you know, like, that he realized he messed up um, in this one manner. In chapter 21, like I mentioned, this was, this was God's breaking point, you know, that uh, the events that had occurred with Naboth, you know, Naboth's unjust murder, um, the Lord, uh, he, gets, he gets Elijah to confront Ahab one more time, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you because it is very, the, the Lord is, is to, to put it simply, the Lord is very upset at Ahab over the events uh, that had occurred with, with Naboth. If you wish to turn with me to chapter 21, I'm going to go ahead and read from, chap, uh, from verse 20. 21 verse 20 as it reads, Ahab said to Elijah, this is Elijah's coming up to Ahab to confront him over what had occurred with Naboth. Uh, verse 20, Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? He answered, Elijah speaking, I have found you because you sold yourself to do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring disaster upon you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ajia, for the anger for which you have provoked me and because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dog shall eat. And any one of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heaven shall eat. You know, we, we see here this language that Elijah uses, that the Lord commanded him to use. Um, it's very, 
uh, it's very harsh. It's, it's very ups- uh, There's a level of anger that the Lord has, ju- uh, a justified anger that the Lord has with Ahab over the events that occurred with Naboth. You know that, that like I mentioned, this was this was the Lord's limit. You know, had said like this is enough. You know, because of this sin that you have committed, uh, not only will you die, Ahab, but the rest of your family will die as a result. So you know, already we see this level of condemnation that is brought to Ahab and his household, and. And for once in Ahab's life, he actually repents. If you wish to follow with me, continuing in verse 25, um, I like how the writer of 1 Kings, you know, they remind people in verses 25 and 26, um, j- just reminding them that Ahab was very evil, as it reads, There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab, whom Jezebel his wife incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. The writer is reminding us, you know, that, that Ahab was an evil man, and they want to preface this right before what occurs after. Oh, uh, they want to preface this, remind people of how Ahab was, uh, in, uh, just to remind them, you know, just uh, so that we can see his reaction. Verse 27. And when Ahab heard these words, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his, flat, on his flesh, and fasted in, and lay in sackcloth, and went about dejectedly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he humbled himself before me, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days I will bring the disaster upon his house. We see this, um, that at this one moment, you know, Ahab really, truly realizes just how much he messed up, you know, just how much, uh, how deep in sin he was. And instead of pushing away Elijah, instead of, um, you know, like reveling in his sin, he actually repented for once in his life. Uh, he truly understood, um, you know, going back to the, to the Meridian Webster uh, diction, uh, dictionary definition, you know, how, how he had, uh, there was a, a change in his heart, a change in his mind of, of who he was supposed to be. Um, you know, he had this level of regret, he, as it states, he humbled himself here. The actions that he took, um, there's multiple points in the Bible where people, when they realize they sin, you know, they, they put themselves in this very miserable state where they're fasting um, and they like put, essentially put sackcloth, you know, very low quality clothing on themselves. You know, this is a king who's supposed to wear the most, uh, the most beautiful garments, you know, eat the, eat the greatest food he could, you know, he, he was the most powerful man in the land of Israel, and yet he chose to put himself in this lowly position because he realized how much he had messed up. And as a result, the Lord was able to grant him a level of mercy. And I truly believe that if Ahab had continued in humbling himself, uh, had continued on this path um, to follow the Lord, the, um, he would have been blessed more, you know, if he had changed his life and he had ended up actually being a good king. You know, we could have read the story of Ahab, uh, you know, the man who started off as an evil king but turned out to be a good king. Um, you know, I believe the Lord would have blessed him had he chosen to follow him. But like I mentioned in chapter 22, uh, that is not what happens with Ahab. Instead, he, he, you know, while he began to start following the Lord at the end of chapter 21, uh, you know, while, while he repented of his sins, he went back to his old ways, unfortunately, once again. Um, and chapter 22, like I mentioned, it ends off with his death, you know, with him being outside of the grace of God, outside of the mercy of the Lord. Um, and it's, it's, it's very unfortunate. Um, where am I out of my notes? But we, uh, but what we see here, at least with the story of Ahab, is any time he chose to, de- uh, to stay away from the Lord, uh, to do his own thing, um, he ended up suffering, he ended up failing. Um, but whenever he chose to follow the Lord, whenever he chose to repent of his sins, the Lord would actually bless him and grant him mercy. Um, and that's something we can learn from that. I can't believe we're already at 1122. Good night. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through this, uh, the second part a little faster. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's one account that, um, that we read in the Old Testament, the story of King Ahab, someone who, uh, who, had, multiple time, who had multiple chances uh, to repent of his sins and choose to follow the Lord. And there was times where he got very close to it, but he ended up failing. Um, but there's actually another account in the Bible that we find um, of, of, a, of a similar king. If you can, turn with me to, uh, to 2 Kings chapter 21. We're going to go through this part a little quicker. 2 Kings chapter 21. I think some of y'all might already know who I'm talking about. So this, this, uh, this other king was actually a king of the southern kingdom. His name was King uh, Manasseh. He succeeded his father, Hezekiah. Hezekiah was not a perfect king, but he, he was ultimately a king that did his best to follow the Lord. Um, and he's a major character in 2 Kings. Um, but his son succeeds him, and his son is described to be a very evil king. 
Um, just going to go uh, through his account real quickly. Um, it, if you read through chapter 21 of Second Kings, it talks about um, how he brought back idol worship. You know, his father had tried to take out the idols uh, from the land of Judah, and yet he brought them back. In verse, in chap, First Kings chapter, I'm sorry, Second Kings chapter 21, verse three. Uh, he's actually, uh, I'll just re- read it right here. This is this is about Manasseh. This is a different king. Uh, for he rebuilt the high places that Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he erected altars for Baal and made an Asherah, as, as Ahab the king of Israel had done, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. So we see uh, Manasseh is a different king who was very similar to Ahab. He's, he's compared to Ahab in this one verse, um, you know, bringing back idol worship. If you continue reading this chapter, um, it talks about how he brings... Now, he brought human sacrifice to the land, you know, how he started uh, engaging in witchcraft. Uh, he is described uh, not only to be as evil as the other kings of the world, um, but to, uh, he's described as more evil than those kings, you know, that's, that he's an even newer low. Um, and verse 16 at the end of this chapter talks about how he, how he shed innocent blood. Um, so just reading through this chapter, chapter 21 of, of 2 Kings, um, Manasseh is, is, is viewed as, as almost an evil king, and, and as someone who, you know, had, uh, has read their Bible growing up, um, when I first read this account, for years I had believed, oh, Manasseh, he's, he, was an evil, he was an evil king, you know, um, growing up in Bible school, you know, we often had, like, there was the good kings uh, in the land of Judah, and there were the bad kings, and for the longest time I had believed Manasseh was one of the bad kings, and if all you read of him was 2 Kings chapter 21, you would, it's very easy to think, yeah, he was a bad king, um, but we actually have another account of his story. Uh, Second Chronicles chapter 33 goes a bit more into his life. There's, uh, there's more uh, to talk about him. Um, his story doesn't end there, and it's really fascinating, actually. If you turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 33, the first nine verses are very similar to what we read earlier. Um, you know, it describes uh, Manasseh as a king who, follow, uh, who succeeded his father Hezekiah um, and how he was an evil king, you know, how he brought the idol worship, how he brought human sacrifice back uh, to the land, um, you know, how he's described as, as a very evil king. But his story doesn't end there. In verse, in verse 10, it talks about... Um, it talks about that the, uh, I'll just read it, verse 10, the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no, deten- no attention. While Manasseh was engaging in, this evil, in these evil acts, in this evil worship, the Lord, most likely through, uh, through different prophets, uh, tried to remind Manasseh of, of the evil that he was doing, you know, to, uh, telling him, you need to repent, um, you know, like, to be like your father, Hezekiah, you know, he was, he was a king who followed me, you need to be like him, most likely, is what they had told Manasseh, and yet he chose to reject them, and as a result, in verses 11 through 15, it talks about how Manasseh was captured by the Assyrians. Uh, he was taken captive by them, and, and you know, he was put in, in a state of misery, um, essentially being punished by the Lord for his actions, for bringing the evil to the land. But if you read through, the, uh, through that section, verses 11, uh, verses 12 and 13, it talks about that unlike Ahab, he actually repented of his sins. Um, uh, it talks about how, uh, how he recognized what he did was wrong. If anything, I'm just going to go ahead and read it. Verse, uh, verse 11, I'll start there. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria, who captured Manasseh with the hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. He prayed to them, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. We see that in this, in this low moment uh, that Manasseh experiences, you know, he is humbled by these events, you know, taken prisoner by the Assyrians, essentially, you know, suffering for the sins that he committed, for bringing Judah back into sin, back into idolatry. Um, and it's at this low moment that Manasseh genuinely repents, similar to Ahab, uh, you know, when, when Ahab was in that low moment, he repented of his sins, and Manasseh likewise repented. But the difference is, he, when he returned home, um, instead of Ahab, when, after Ahab repented, he went back to his old ways. He went back to, uh, you know, following his false idols, following his own self-interests. But Manasseh, if you continue reading, it talks about that he chose to, 
He chose to work for the Lord. He chose uh, to change his life, you know, and, and, and do stuff for the better. Um, verse Verses 14 through 20 talk about this. Verse 14 talks about how he fortified defenses for Jerusalem and the other cities in Judah, you know, wanting to protect his people, um, you know, recognizing that, hey, uh, the Assyrians are after us. We need to make sure we defend ourselves. So not only did he try to offer an extra level of protection, uh, physical protection for his people, but also spiritual protection. Verse 15 talks about how he removed the idols that he had brought in. Um, if you read through uh, through First, Second Kings, First, Second Chronicles, there's multiple accounts of when a bad king brings idols to the land, and then a good king succeeds them and removes the idols from the land. But Manasseh, he was different in that at the beginning of his reign, he brought those idols, he brought the evil to the land, but then um, but then he himself removed them. You know, instead of someone else doing the job for him, he did it himself. He repented uh, for the evil that he had done to the land. In verses 16 through 17, it talks about how he promoted the worship of the Lord. You know, he wanted to restore God back into the land. You know, remind people, remind the Israelites of who they were, how they were children of the Lord. Um, and he wanted them to, uh, to follow him. And as a result, um, if you finish the rest of this chapter, it, talk, it talks about how Manasseh ultimately ended up being a good king. And it's, it's, a, it's a great story of redemption, you know. The story of Ahab is a tragedy, is, is one of someone who, who had multiple chances to turn to the Lord, and he got close a couple of times, but ultimately uh, chose to reject the Lord and chose to do his own thing. But Manasseh, someone who was compared at first to Ahab, chose to do something completely different. Not only did he repent, he chose to follow the Lord and do everything in his power um, do everything in his power to follow him and to and to bless others, uh, bless others like that. And I went through that part a little quicker, but that's okay. And I, I think that's this is a great point to, to end off this lesson is to compare these two kings and to ask ourselves who are we more like at this moment? Are are we like Ahab, where we when we see when we examine our lives, we recognize there is sin. You know, Ahab recognized he had messed up multiple times, but in recognizing that, you know, Ahab at first repented, but then chose to go back to that sin, chose to go back to those old ways? Or are we like Manasseh, someone who lived in sin like Ahab, but after recognizing the sin that he had done, after being put in his place by the Lord, you know, not only repented of his sins, but made an effort to change his life? Likewise, as Christians, that's what we're supposed to do. Before we find Christ, um, you know, we live uh, we lived a life of our own, you know, a life where uh, the only God that we answered to was ourselves. But as Christians, we recognize that, that living that personal life is a sinful life, is a life that God doesn't want for us. He wants us to, to repent of those sins that we had and to follow him once again. Um, so with that, I conclude my lesson. Um, as always, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, we always end off uh, our lessons with uh, an invitation, reminding people um, that if you have not followed the Lord, you have a chance today to do that. You can be like, like I mentioned, you can be like Manasseh, and you can choose to repent of your sins, uh, to confess Jesus as king, and to be, be baptized into the water today. I believe the waters behind me um, are good. If they're not, you know, we can find somewhere else. Um, so if you choose to repent, you have that opportunity this morning. Um, but if you are a Christian, and you feel that you've, you've strayed away uh, from the Lord, you know, you feel that um, that maybe you're in a position like Ahab, you know, someone who has been following their own desires um, and not following the Lord's. You can choose to change that today. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are a family here, and all we, all we wish to do is support you and pray for you and, and bless you uh, because we love you and we care for you. If there's any needs that you have that need to be made known, you can come up front as we stand and sing the song of encouragement. <laughs>